Okay. Let me get my. Yeah. Okay. Charger. Good. I'm all ready. Just let me know. Okay. Today we're happy to have Simeon uh, to tell us a uh, precision correlator that large R charge. Simeon had promised a revolution, so we're looking forward to seeing. No, sorry, actually, that, that isn't going to happen. I didn't solve the stuff that I was going to solve. Later. So it's actually going to be the same boring talk I told you you could have had two months ago. It's not going to be boring. So looking yeah. forward to it. Go for it. Okay. Um, okay. Um, let me get this bar off. There we go. Okay. You can all see the slides? Yes. Okay. Okay. So I'm excited for the opportunity to address the uh, Q of T and geometry seminar series um, uh, on the theme of the emergence of classical physics from quantum physics in the regime of large quantum number. Um, better light here. Oh, the light in this. Okay. Um, my subject is the simplification of otherwise strongly coupled uh, quantum systems in the limit of large quantum number, which I will refer to generically as J. And by otherwise strongly coupled, I mean outside of any simplifying limit where the theory becomes semi-classical for other reasons, or possibly in a simplifying limit uh, where the quantum number is taken so large that the uh, uh, system behaves differently than you might have expected despite being weakly coupled. So large quantum number in particular can make naive perturbation expansions break down. So the primary question in such a talk is, is this even a subject? Uh, the answer is yes. And in some sense, it's an old subject. Uh, many examples have appeared very far back into the past in the literature. And recently, uh, there have been a number of groups focusing on systematizing this point of view and applying it as broadly as possible. So um, in prehistory, you have uh, uh, Democritus and the atomic hypothesis, you have Bohr and the correspondence principle. Um, more recently, you have like the BMN limit in N equals four, you have uh, in bootstrap, you have the large spin expansion in generic CFT from light cone bootstrap. Uh, you have a large spin expansion in hadrons. Um, and then uh, somewhat arbitrarily cutting off the modern history at uh, 2015, you have large charge expansions in generic systems with abelian global symmetries, with non-abelian symmetries, with charge and spin, topological charge, uh, EFT connection with bootstrap, large charge limit in gravity. Um, and then uh, I think a lot of what I'll be talking about today is uh, um, large uh, chiral rings at large R charge and their correspondence with uh, vacuum manifolds, particularly vacuum manifolds of uh, complex dimension one. Uh, so in, in uh, three dimensions and four dimensions, both with n equals two supersymmetry. And then there have been interesting uh, sort of scaling limits with large charge and other things taken, uh, taken limits at the same time. Um, and then in addition, the, in the last few years, I can't even uh, keep up with all the interesting things that have been happening in this area. So I'll just give a, a, an extremely incomplete uh, sampling of references from like 2018 to 21. And then it still seems to be accelerating a lot of extremely interesting papers in 2022 already um, on these kind of large quantum number limits, both uh, theoretical and you know, numerical. Um, so the goals of the large quantum number expansion uh, overlap to a great extent with the goals of the conformal bootstrap. So uh, namely, one would like to learn to systematically and efficiently analyze quantum field theories, in practice, usually CFT, uh, just for additional simplification, uh, that have no exact solution in terms of explicit functions. So we'd all like to know, what does theory space look like for generic theories and generic observables in generic theories? Well, this is a very consequential question for all sorts of sub areas, uh, from mathematics to phenomenology to cosmology. Most theories are not integrable. 
and we need to learn how to attack them in general circumstances. Um, direct numerical bootstrap methods are remarkably efficient. Their power law and the number of operators exchanged in the, in the uh, intermediate channel but uh, since number of operators grows exponentially with dimension or central charge or whatever uh, parameter in some extreme limit, uh, um, uh, the number of operators grows exponentially, typically, a direct numerical attack is still intractable uh, in extreme limits. Now, fortunately, uh, known extreme limits uh, all seem to have uh, simplifying behaviors in all known circumstances, which in some sense broadly generalizes the notion of duality. So for the case of large spin in a single plane, uh, that limit has been analyzed within bootstrap itself. Um, and the relative ease of that has to do with the fact that the space-time coordinates themselves carry that quantum number of spin in a single plane. For other quantum numbers, uh, including even as simple a, a variation as the case of large spin in multiple planes in four or more dimensions, there's no known analytic bootstrap method to analyze that question systematically, like the, the dimension of the lowest operator, say, with, uh, with spin in, in two planes simultaneously, with both spins being large. So in many cases, uh, limits like that are accessible to some new kinds of effective field theory. Uh, in regions where bootstrap methods slow down. And we'll see that there's also excellent agreement uh, where various methods overlap. So now what does this leave us? Uh, what do we hope to accomplish? Well, most uh, grandiosely, um, we could try to derive EFT behavior from the bootstrap equations. And I think it's a really important uh, thing to try to understand how that happens. Uh, so important that I worked on it for, like a year plus and got absolutely nowhere. So uh, I'm not gonna talk about that. Um, there have been some very interesting work, uh, uh, sort of still a mostly isolated result, but using some small subset of EFT inputs to get some subset of CFT data, not numerically accessible. Um, but so far that hasn't developed very rapidly. So I'm going to tell you about the modest goal of translating EFT behavior into bootstrap terms, saying what it means for CFT data, and then checking via other methods to see how, how good those approximations are. And the main point I want to drive home is that these large quantum number approximations are phenomenally good where other methods break down, um, even for rather low values of the quantum. So uh, I'll start with the simplest example, uh, the conformal Wilson-Fisher O2 model at large O2 charge or large SO2 charge J. So um, this uh, theory is defined by a complex scalar field in three dimensions with a quartic you know, super renormalizable potential and then a, a mass counter term with uh, the, the strength of the potential being taken to infinity. Uh, but M tuned so that you're at a quantum uh, critical point, quantum mechanically. Oops. Uh, so the canonical question about large charge would be something like, what's the dimension delta sub J of the lowest operator of charge J with J large? What's like the asymptotic expansion for, uh, right, for that, uh, that operator dimension? So you can immediately translate by a radial quantization and ask what's the energy of the lowest state of charge J on a unit two sphere. A renormalization group analysis reveals that the low lying large charge sector is described by an effective theory of a single compact scalar chi, which can be thought of as the phase variable of the complex scalar. Uh, so the leading order Lagrangian of the EFT is remarkably simple. Uh, it's just uh, B times the absolute value of the gradient uh, of the phase variable, cubed. That's it. And it's, uh, I think it's really striking. This is literally, when you think about it, the, not the simplest, but the second simplest quantum field theory Lagrangian you can possibly write down, right? The simplest theory is a free massless scalar that's grad chi cubed. Uh, grad chi squared, but this is just grad chi cubed. 
Um, it's literally the second simplest thing you could try writing down. And it is, in fact, the correct leading order uh, Lagrangian describing the large charge sector of the Wilson Fisher model. And we'll see actually many other models as well. Um, now, the coefficient b is not something we know how to compute analytically. And by the way, notice you can't just absorb it into a normalization of chi because chi is 2 pi periodically identified. Um, so b is a real parameter, and we don't know how to compute it. Uh, but nonetheless, the simple structure of this EFT has sharp and unexpected consequences. And I, I mean, we don't know how to compute it analytically. Numerically, it's actually been pinned down to extremely good accuracy at this point. So the immediate consequence of the structure of this EFT is that the lowest operator is a scalar of dimension uh, some coefficient that can be written in terms of b times j to the 3 halves. Uh, the leading order EFT predicts more than just the leading power law because quantum loop effects in the EFT are suppressed at large j, so the EFT can be quantized as a weakly coupled effective action with effective loop counting parameter j to the minus 3 halves. Um, so for instance, we can compute the entire spectrum of low-lying excited primaries. Uh, the dimensions, spins, and degeneracies of the excited primaries are those of a Fox space with oscillators of spin L with L greater than or equal to two. So uh, the propagation speed of the chi field is just given by one over root two times the speed of light. And so the frequencies of the oscillators are root L times L plus one uh, over root two for L greater than or equal to one. Uh, so the L equals one oscillator is present, but it doesn't give you primaries. It only gives you descendants. Uh, the leading order condition for a state to be primary is that there be no L equals one oscillators excited. So for instance, the first excited primary of charge J always has spin two and dimension uh, delta sub J, where J is the, the uh, lowest operator dimension, plus root three, plus terms subleading in J. Now, subleading terms can also be computed, and these depend on the higher derivative terms in the effective action with powers of absolute value grad chi in the denominator. And those counter terms have a natural hierarchical organization in J. Uh, so at any given order in derivatives, uh, there are only a finite number of such terms, and actually they're fairly sparse at low orders. Um, so at a given order in the large J expansion, only a finite number of these terms contribute. And since there are far more observables than there are effective terms, there is an infinite number of theory independent relations among terms in the asymptotic expansions of various observables. So our gradient cube term is the only term <coughs> allowed by the symmetries at order j to the 3 halves. And there's only one other term contributing with a non-negative power of j. And it's, it's this thing here. It has two pieces with a definite uh, relative coefficient fixed by conformal invariance. Uh, RIC3 is the three-dimensional Ricci scalar. And then B sub half is another unknown Wilson coefficient in the large charge EFT action. Now, I, I want to point out that there are no terms in the EFT uh, scaling as j to the zero. And the result of that is that the j to the zero term in the expansion of the operator dimension is calculable with uh, independent of the unknown coefficients in the effect of Lagrangian. And that was a very nice clue that has allowed us to you know, verify uh, the, the, the applicability of this EFT in many interesting cases already. So specifically, the formula for delta sub j takes the form uh, uh, c sub 3 halves uh, j to the 3 halves, c sub uh, 1 half j to the 1 half minus 0 0.0937256 and so on, up to terms vanishing at large j. And by the way, I should say that uh, this term was originally computed by uh, myself, Mastaka Watanabe, uh, Susanna Reffert, and Domenico Orlando, and was first correctly computed a year later by, by uh, Alexander Monin. We made a little boo-boo in, uh, in the numerical value. But this is the correct uh, value. Um, so this universal term and other universal large J relations in the O2 model don't have any fudge factors or adjustable parameters. Once you've committed to the universality class, and sometimes uh, I 
don't have space to talk about it here, but sometimes the universality class is just forced on you and you have no choice, as in the Wilson Fisher model. Um, uh, those values and relations are universal and absolute. And there have also been similar predictions made for OPE coefficients uh, by, by, by um, the EPFL group, uh, Ritazzi, uh, Monin, uh, Sebold, uh, Pierce, Kalava, uh, and Monin, if I didn't say Monin. Um, okay, so before taking questions, let me just anticipate some that I get a lot. So you might think that there's something like weird or inconsistent or uncontrolled about a Lagrangian like grad chi cubed. So let me anticipate some frequently asked questions. So one question is, isn't this Lagrangian singular? Uh, it's a non-analytic functional of the field. So when you expand around chi equals zero, you get ill-defined amplitudes. But of course, you're not supposed to use the Lagrangian around chi equals zero. It's only meant to be expanded uh, around the large charge vacuum which always has chi uh, linear in time and constant in space. Uh, then the expansion into Bevan fluctuations carries a suppression of mu to the minus one or more for each fluctuation, which means j to the minus one half or more for each fluctuation. So there's nothing singular about expanding the action around the large charge vacuum. Um, and I should say that the Nambo Goto action is also of this kind. So it's not nothing very exotic about it. Um, second question, isn't this effective theory ultraviolet divergent, right? There are loop corrections, uh, but aren't those incalculable? You know, aren't the observables meaningless beyond leading order? But no, uh, the EFT is quantized in a limit where loop corrections are small. So the UV cutoff, uh, is always taken to be parametrically higher than the infrared scale, parametrically lower than the UV scale. And, you know, this is the standard uh, EFT thing, same way you treat the, uh, the Chiro Lagrangian. Uh, not only is the theory uh, under perturbative control, the renormalization of counter terms is also under perturbative control. Loop divergences are suppressed uh, by powers of the Wilsonian cutoff cubed over root of the three halves. And so you can just subtract them off systematically. Okay, but then you might ask, don't the counter terms render everything incalculable? But no, as usual in EFT, the counter term ambiguities of subtraction correspond one-to-one -one with terms in the original action which are allowed by the symmetries. Uh, and so as we've mentioned, there are only a finite and small number of those contributing at any given order in the expansion. And at some orders, there are no ambiguities at all. So then you may ask, wait, are you saying that every CFT with a conserved global charge has the exact same asymptotic expansion? And then, you know, there are various counterexamples you can come up with. Uh, we're not trying to claim anything as broad as that. So the RG analysis, I, I described applies to many, but not all CFT. More generally, there are, uh, you know, CFT with global symmetries apparently can be organized into large charge universality classes, which coarse grain uh, the theories to a certain extent, but still have distinct, uh, distinct universality classes. Uh, but I, I will say that so far as we know, and conjecturally we think this is true, that all theories with only uh, 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 an O2 global symmetry and no more than that, but also with parity symmetry, so no parity breaking. Uh, so far, it appears that these are all in the same large J universality class as the O2 model, and even even a couple models that don't satisfy those don't satisfy those criteria. Even those seem to be in the same universality class. So so even just this one universality class seems to be very powerful um, and describe a lot of, a lot of things. Um, so before I go on to other universality classes, questions, are there questions so far on the one I've discussed? Can I ask a question? Yeah, please. Um, so, so like in the Pion Lagrangian, sometimes we talk about like, sometimes we talk about like uh, West Amino terms or other like topological terms. So, um, are there such topological terms in your EFT and what do they do? Right, so, so in this three-dimensional EFT, um, as far as I know, no. 
um, uh, sorry, <laughs> in the parity symmetric version of this three-dimensional EFT, uh, the answer is no. There are no uh, topological terms, basically because you always need the epsilon tensor to write one. Um, in, um, uh, but there, there are parity breaking versions, which have been analyzed by, ooh, um, uh, uh, I believe, well, okay, I, I, by Delacrotaz and some very good co-authors whose names I'm sorry that I'm blanking on. It's in my slides, but um, or it's in my reference slide. Let me get it. Anyway, the, the parity breaking case has been analyzed. Um, and there is a, a topological term that's extremely important and, and changes uh, the, the predictions quite a lot. Um, and I'm just, it's somewhere on this page and then my eyes aren't finding it anyway. Um, but I, I will give the reference later. Please ask me in the Q&A after, I'll find it. Sure. Anyway, okay, yes, parity breaking case has been analyzed and there is a, uh, a topological term which has, as you would expect, dramatic effects. And it seems likely that, that the uh, generic churn signs matter theories at large baryon number or, or monopole number are in this uh, universe, lar parity breaking large charge universality class. Okay, thanks. Uh, I have a question. Yeah. Uh, is there any more sort of robust uh, sort of way of organizing these, these different classes without having to specifically compute the large J effective theory? Well, so yeah, is there any more robust way of, of doing which? Of, of defining these different these different universality classes. Define it well. I mean, you know, are, are, I would just say that the that the universality class is defined by the by the symmetries and light fields around the large charge vacuum. In the same way that that uh, the ordinary field theoretic universality class is defined by the light fields and symmetries about the, the vacuum vacuum. Okay, I'll ask my question again. Other questions so far? Okay, well, uh, I mean, uh, I don't wanna cut people off, but if there are, please break in any time. Um, Anyway, there are many other interesting universality classes in three dimensions. Um, large another charge in the ON models, a large topological charge in the CPN models. Um, and this is, uh, th this case is gonna be very interesting. Uh, it'll turn out um, large baryon charge and monopole charge in various churn simons matter theories. It would be very interesting to investigate the, uh, the Fermi-Bose duality at a uh, large charge. Hasn't, hasn't been done, uh, but I think it, it would be a very interesting direction. Uh, then uh, what I'll talk more about today is vacuum moduli spaces and the large R charge limit. So I didn't yet say anything about supersymmetry. I think Probably most of you all know all about it, uh, but for those who don't, I'll just say it's a very nice constraining type of symmetry that relates fermions and bosons. Uh, for conformal supersymmetric theories in four dimensions, there is always at least a continuous global symmetry commuting non-trivially with the super generators called an R symmetry. And often uh, theories with SUSY have non-unique ground states, uh, even non-unique up to symmetry rotation. Those are called vacuum manifolds or vacuum moduli spaces. Um, and among the most tractable universality classes at large, are large R charge in extended superconformal theories with moduli spaces of supersymmetric vacuum. So I'm gonna mostly talk about those, um, though I will come back to the non-supersymmetric examples when I get to the section on confirmation and uh, verification of these experiences. So the simplest case to discuss is the n equals two, d equals three superconformal fixed point of three chiral superfields with superpotential x, y, z. So without loss of generality, you can consider the x branch uh, whose uh, coordinate ring, how did I go out of full screens? Um, 
the X branch uh, whose coordinate ring is spanned by X to the J with non-negative J. So these BPS scale, scalar chiral primary operators are the X branch part of the chiral ring of the theory. And now the first thing you have to be careful once you start analyzing these supersymmetric examples is that the things which were interesting but tractable in the non-supersymmetric examples become trivial and boring in the uh, supersymmetric examples. So you have to be careful to find something more interesting to do. Uh, so the x to the j just has dimension j uh, because it's BPS protected and it's an exact property of, of supersymmetry. Um, the next lowest state uh, with charge j is also a scalar and has dimension exactly j plus one, which is also boring. Um, uh, it's, it's protected, it's in a different sort of uh, 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 a protected state. It's what's called a scalar semi-short rep. Um, anyway, but we would like to see the exact vanishing of the corrections. Uh, we'd like to be able to verify that in large charge perturbation theory. And we'd also like to be able to compute things like third lowest operator dimension, which isn't protected. And maybe, you know, OBE coefficients and whatnot. So what is the effective theory? It's not the same effective theory. So this is really a different large J universality class. Um, uh, so to, to address uh, the way uh, Ibu sort of wanted to, to frame it, uh, here, since supersymmetry is unbroken at large R charge in this theory, um, the, the degrees of freedom organize themselves into a full chiral multiplet in the effective theory. So uh, there is a... Uh, uh, approximately free chiral multiplet phi, which is the three quarter power of the X field. And the leading Lagrangian is free. And then there are higher derivative D terms. So to compute operator dimensions, you quantize the theory around the lowest classical solution uh, with given large J on an S2 spatial slice. And now the classical solution is, uh, uh, is the same sort of thing. The magnitude is fixed. The uh, the phase is linear in time with a, a, a frequency that's set by the BPS uh, found. Um, uh, so then you can do a direct diagrammatic quantization of this large R charge effective theory just to, as a kind of means of calibration to check whether the exact predictions of supersymmetry are actually you know, confirmed to all, to all orders or as, as far as you can compute anyway. So the result of the direct diagrammatic quantization are as follows. Um, for the lowest state, uh, you can compute up to and including two loops, and you find that the dimension is just j plus 0 plus 0 plus 0 plus 0. Um, and then for the uh, second lowest, you can compute up to and including one loop, and you find the dimension is j plus 1 plus 0 plus 0 plus 0. So again, exactly. Uh, confirming the predictions of supersymmetry to the order we can calculate, but computing directly uh, in this EFT in terms of diagrams. So then just to compute something non-trivial, we computed the third lowest primary uh, operator dimension, uh, which is a non-BPS scalar primary with dimension J plus two plus zero plus zero minus 192 pi squared kappa J to the minus three. So um, uh, kappa is the coefficient of the leading interaction term in the EFT. And I wrote just one term to normalize uh, our convention for how we're defining kappa. Um, so the Lagrangian, there are many, many other component terms for this D term, but the easiest way to get the normalization nailed down is to tell you just the purely bosonic uh, component of this, the purely uh, scalar component of this term with no curvatures and so on. But there are many terms with curvatures and multi-fermions and things. This just fixes the normalization. Now, we don't know the value of kappa in the effective theory. We have no way of knowing it really. Uh, but we do know its sign, which is positive by a superluminality constraint. The, the sort of uh, Arkani Hamed, uh, uh, Nicholas uh, Bafa, that sort of. Superluminality constraint. Um, so the first 
non-protected operator dimension gets a contribution of order j to the minus three with a negative coefficient of unknown magnitude, presumably of order one. Um, so questions so far. Okay, now I'm gonna leave this theory behind because it's a little bit boring. It was just to show you that these methods you know, are reliable. Uh, they reproduce the things they're supposed to reproduce. But it's more fun to compute quantities which are both non-trivial in the large J expansion and checkable in principle by exact supersymmetric methods like localization. So one nice example is the two-point function of chiral primary operators in eight supercharge theories. Um, and the technically simplest class uh, are the chiral primaries in the Coulomb branch chiral ring in four-dimensional n equals two theories in the special case where the gauge group has rank one. And these theories are simple for many reasons I'll discuss in a minute, but the, the biggest reason is that in these theories, there's only one operator, uh, only one chiral primary operator of each R charge. So you don't have to say which one you mean, right? You can just ask about the uh, properties of the, uh, of the lowest operator of a given R charge. And there's just one of them. Um, so various examples include n equals four super yang mills with gauge group SU2, n equals two super QCD with uh, uh, four uh, hypermultiplets in the fundamental rep. And then there are many rank one non-Lagrangian arduous Douglas theories, all with one dimensional Coulomb branch. And some of these are Lagrangian, some are non-Lagrangian, but none of that matters, right? Field theoretic perturbation theory plays no role in, in any of these considerations. So we can treat you know, n equals four, n equals two super QCD and our Jairus Douglas theories all on the same footing using the same set of tricks. Um, so the Coulomb branch chiral ring in a rank one theory uh, is spanned by powers of the chiral ring generator and powers. So if it has dimension delta, um, these uh, uh, operators have dimension and R charge J equals N delta. And so at large R charge in radial quantization, these correspond again to classical solutions on the sphere where the Coulomb branch scalar gets a VEV proportional to root J over R. So for Lagrangian theories, uh, the generator uh, is trace phi hat squared uh, and delta equals two. Uh, for non-Lagrangian theories, delta is you know some other value. There's a there's a you know finite list of them, but there are you know there are like half a dozen or a couple more uh, of these rank one non-Lagrangian theories. So we can write the large J effective action again in terms of an effective field where you just take the one over delta power of the chiral ring generator, um, and this field is free at leading order. Um, so the leading order action is, is free. And the first uh, big difference uh, from the case of the XYZ model is that the first subleaning term uh, in the effective Lagrangian of these theories is, uh, uh, it's not a D term. It sort of looks like a D term, but that's misleading. It's written as a full superspace integral, but it's a full superspace integral of a non-single valued uh, object. It's, it's really just a convenient way of writing an F term. Uh, the F term form of it is single valued, but has a lot more terms. Uh, and it has a coefficient alpha, which is fixed by an anomaly. In particular, it's fixed by the uh, vial anomaly, the vial A anomaly mismatch. Uh, so it's the difference between the A anomaly of the underlying CFT and the vacuum manifold EFT in certain uh, units times two. Uh, so some comments on the interaction term, it was first written down by uh, 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 Grissaro, Rocek, Gates, and Siegel uh, as the unique four derivative term in the Coulomb branch EFT of an N equals two gauge theory. Uh, it's, it's formally a D term, but it's not really a D term. Uh, it's bosonic content, uh, or it's it rather, sorry, it's scalar content uh, is the famous West Zemino uh, term for the vial A anomaly 
that was used by Kamargadsky and Schwimmer to prove the uh, A theorem in four dimensions. And that's why alpha is proportional to the A anomaly mismatch. One other remarkable fact about rank one theories is that the anomaly term uh, is the unique F term on conformally flat space. That uh, it's definitely not obvious. It took us a while to sort that out. And I guess I'm told, I was told much later that it was a sort of believed to be true among many uh, sub-communities, but you know, there's never been a very simple proof of that, this fact, but it, it appears to be the case. Um, so there are an infinite number of higher derivative D terms, but there are no higher derivative F terms one can construct out of a single vector multiplet in a superconformal N equals two theory in four dimensions. Um, anyway, there are various ways to see this, none of which are that simple. Uh, so the EFT is therefore of the form free term, anomaly term, and then higher D terms. And if we're computing like F term protected quantities, the higher D terms don't matter, you can ignore it. Uh, and by the way, note that the dimension of the generator of the Cairo ring doesn't enter into the EFT at all. That's really microscopic information. It's not, uh, it's, it's sort of microscopic information. And then uh, the marginal coupling tau also does not enter. So in other words, any purely F term dependent observable has a large J expansion that is uniquely determined by the anomaly coefficient alpha and nothing else. You can just quantize this uh, two term EFT uh, as an effective theory and you get automatically uh, unique answers to all orders in one over J for F term protected quantities for a uh, one dimensional Coulomb branch of an N equals two gauge theory. So I just made some very strong claims. Um, please, if there are any questions about those now, I'll answer them as best I can. And then I'll go on to show you the consequences of those and, and some checks on those. Okay, I'll do it then. Um, so one set of F term protected observables are the Coulomb branch correlation functions, which is to say not the, uh, not the uh, power law in the two point function, because the power law is, uh, is fixed by the dimension, which is fixed by supersymmetry, uh, but the, the actual coefficient of the two point function. Normally we just set that to one, but notice that for, for chiral rings, uh, you can uh, define the normalization of these operators by associativity. You just multiply n powers of them without any subtractions. That's finite in an n equals two theory or any theory with a the chiral ring. Um, so the coefficient uh, is actually non-trivial uh, information, which is equivalent to a, to a three-point function. But it's easier to think of them as uh, coefficients and two-point functions for our purposes. So then this quantity Z sub N, uh, I'm going to define with an extra factor of the vacuum partition function thrown in so that these Z sub N equals E to the Q sub N are, can be thought of as partition functions with sources. And the sources are just the logarithms, the negatives of the logarithms of the operator insertions. When, uh, when, uh, operator insertions are very you know, large or very high dimension or very many powers of a repeated thing, it's more efficient to just absorb them uh, into the as localized terms in an effective action. So this quantity Z sub N can be thought of as a partition function of the EFT with uh, sources. Um, now this quantity is scheme dependent dependent on a particular counter term and also on the normalization of the Cairo ring generator, but those dependencies cancel out in certain double differences. So the, those dependencies are canceled in, in these double differences of, of adjacent uh, correlators. So now in principle, you could just evaluate these things with no scheme ambiguities, just evaluate them by directly quantizing the EFT um, with no further input. Uh, from, from the underlying CFT 
as long as you are in large charge, large R charge perturbation theory. So the form of the expansion is this, you have a, a linear term in Q sub n, the log of the correlator, you have a, a term that's n to the one and n to the zero, and these are the scheme dependent bits, a and b, and then the rest of the terms are universal and calculable, um, where I haven't said what these uh, k hats are yet, but these power law terms are all calculable and can be in principle computed by just straightforwardly quantizing uh, the EFT. And then uh, by Feynman diagramology, you can bound the uh, order of the dependence of these k's as functions of the anomaly coefficient. So uh, at uh, order j to the minus m, you have a polynomial of order at most m plus one as a function of alpha. And the diagramology just looks like this. The, uh, the crossed uh, vertices are, are uh, the localized sources, and then the other vertices are the, uh, are the anomaly term. Oh, excuse me, uh, other way around. Sorry, other way around. So of course, directly evaluating multi-loop diagrams in an EFT is hard. So to evaluate the power law corrections, we used a series of tricks, which did nothing but uh, allow us to avoid doing all that work. So with, with, with those various tricks, uh, we were able to solve all the power law corrections for any value of alpha for a Lagrangian or non-Lagrangian theory. Um, with the result that uh, these q sub n's, which are the logs of the correlators, are this uh, linear scheme, in, uh, scheme dependent piece. And then the log of a gamma function, log of gamma of j plus alpha plus one, and then exponentially small corrections. And I'll comment on those in a moment. Um, but first, I'd like to talk about some evidence for this picture of large j self perturbatization. Um, so starting with our predictions for the O2 model, we predicted this uh, formula with these uh, j to the three halves and j to the one half coefficient uh, with unknown coefficients, and then uh, a, a j to the zero term with a calculable coefficient. So it would be great to compare with Bootstrap. So far, Bootstrap hasn't quite gotten there yet, um, at least gotten to uh, sort of, you know, j much larger than two. Uh, but hopefully that will happen. But uh, I'll talk about some other avenues of confirmation. So the first really non-trivial match came from a Monte Carlo analysis up to J equals 15 by Banerjee, Orlando, and Chandra Sakran uh, from five years ago, independently computing charged operator dimensions and estimating these uh, two leading unknown uh, Wilson coefficients. Um, so by fitting with high J uh, results, the authors were able to uh, draw a, uh, a theory curve for the asymptotic expansion, this line, and then um, all of these boxes are uh, Monte Carlo data points with extremely uh, invisible uh, errors. And you can see that even for low J, they go through these low J data points extremely precisely even extrapolating down to j equals zero. Um, quite, uh, quite striking uh, how precise the match is even sort of at or beyond the edge of the regime of validity of the expansion. Um, and so precise bootstrap results so far only exist up to you know, j equals two, but uh, where they can be compared, uh, you know, j equals two, both Monte Carlo and Monte Carlo plus large charge and bootstrap both have uh, you know tenth of a percent accuracy or better, and they agree. Uh, uh, moving beyond the O2 case to other theories in the same large charge universality class, the CPN models at large topological charge um, were attacked by Anton de la Fuente with a combination of um, large n tricks and machine learning tricks. Um, and in particular, he was able to uh, calculate or estimate the, uh, this uh, universal j to the zero coefficient. Uh, and it sits 
you know, with, with error bars, with uh, errors of like uh, three, uh, uh, three ten thousandths, and uh, uh, the, the, the predicted value sits right in the middle of that range. So now let's move on uh, to our predictions for four-dimensional n equals two theories with one-dimensional Coulomb branch. So for uh, u1 free theory and for su2 uh, n equals four uh, super Yang Mills, um, there are not even any exponentially small corrections. The all orders prediction just matches exactly with, uh, with the exact result computed by localization. Now, for other cases, such as n equals two super QCD, um, uh, we can uh, compute by localization and hope to uh, uh, hope to be able to carry it into the large charge regime. And it turns out that one can do extremely well at this. Uh, the localization computation is the hard part. Um, it's hard getting getting high enough, but uh, the um, um, the horizontal axis is is inverse gauge coupling. Uh, the solid lines are the theory curves, and the dots are the localization results. So you can see that um, the results improve uh, as you go to large R charge. Like they're basically perfect at uh, j equals five already, and um, they get worse at weak coupling, as they should. Uh, so it's interesting to try to understand the disagreement between the all orders formula and the exact uh, localization results. So I'm just checking the time. Okay. Um, uh, and the exact localization results. So the framework uh, for large J analysis dictates that any disagreement uh, must be smaller than any power of J and associated with a breakdown of the EFT. So the natural candidate for such an effect would be the propagation of a massive particle over the infrared scale, uh, x minus y, you know, distance between the two insertions. So we'd expect the leading difference between the localization result and the EFT prediction to be of the form, you know, e to the something, uh, e to the minus mass of the BPS particle times the radius, which scales as e to the minus something uh, times root j over m tau. So you can see immediately why the corrections get very small when you go to large R charge and get bigger as you go to weak coupling. Um, so uh, there was an initial uh, estimate for the exponent, which was just done numerically. It was not, uh, not quite right, uh, but uh, it was, it was very close. And you can see even with this crude estimate of the exponent, uh, the fit uh, is extremely good. This is not the fit of the full amplitude. This is just the fit of the exponentially small correction. So this is, in other words, the localization result minus the EFT prediction fit to this uh, uh, massive macroscopic propagation ansatz. Um, Okay, so, so far we've seen that the large quantum number expansion gives an asymptotic expansion for various observables. Um, uh, these methods are applicable to large global charge and generic critical points with global symmetries, um, as well as superconformal fixed points. Uh, the large quantum number limit gives a controlled expansion of many quantities um, with interesting uh, universal uh, uh, parts of the expansion. And for, for the superconformal theories, it's basically all universal. And then the form of the large charge EFT uh, can be quite distinct from any underlying Lagrangian realization. Okay. So um, it's a rather interesting situation now. Uh, due to the magic of supersymmetry, not only can we compute all power law corrections exactly modulo the scheme dependent coefficients, we're actually able to compare to exact results, to a precision where we can see the qualitative breakdown of the effective theory that we used to generate the all orders approximation. And seeing this, one is naturally tempted to try to go further uh, and compare the exponentially small correction with physical expectations at a precision level as well. Um, so in order to do this, one really has to take on the non-universal coefficients A and B. So the sum rules, uh, Basically, uh, to get good enough uh, accuracy, 
the double differences sort of spoil the accuracy. So the first sort of thing we wanted to do was to uh, pin down A and B as functions of the coupling. Um, so this is a little bit technical. I'm not going to dwell too much on it, but if people would like to come back more to it in the q and a i'm I'm happy to do that. Um, but yeah, so a and B are these scheme dependent uh, coefficients. And the first thing we did was uh, was to uh, work out those in the case of super QCD. Um, uh, so for super QCD, a conformal super QCD has a self s duality. Um, uh, so even the A and B coefficients have to be uh, covariant under that. Um, and those uh, that's enough together with matching with one order of perturbation theory uh, is enough to completely nail down the functional dependence uh, of A and B on the coupling. Um, so the first scheme dependent coefficient is the, the A coefficient, which is the coefficient of uh, 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 charge to the first power in the exponent. Uh, it's a kind of classical scheme dependence having to do with the parameterization of the holomorphic gauge coupling, but we can compute it uh, in any scheme we like. Uh, so yeah, let me just zoom through uh, various of these details. Um, uh, but well, let me just say what the scheme dependent uh, dependence is. Um, uh, it has to do with the fact that a chiral primary uh, is in the same uh, superconformal multiplet with a chiral marginal operator. So by acting with uh, four uh, chiral supercharges on the chiral primary, you get a, uh, a marginal operator. And so um, the, uh, the chiral primaries transform as cotangent vectors over the, the conformal manifold. So uh, here, in other words, is the, uh, is the transformation law for a, a chiral primary under a re holomorphic reparameterization of the coupling. So this is the, the scheme dependence of the A coefficient. Looks like this when it's exponentiated. Um, and then there's a second less obvious scheme ambiguity um, related to the Euler density counter term, and this was uh, analyzed a lot by uh, 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 various authors, including uh, Gomez, uh, Gertzkiewicz, uh, Kamargatsky, uh, uh, and uh, Pufu. Uh, so um, why, why should that counter term be relevant at all? It has to do with the fact that these are all secret to the um, partition functions on the four sphere, and the four sphere has a non-zero Euler number. But this scheme ambiguity can be taken into account as well and made covariant under duality symmetry. So I, I'm going to skip a bit, but if people would like to I'll come back to this uh, later, um, I will do it. I'm just trying to sort of define the problem. So supersymmetric recursion relations uh, give, first of all, uh, a, a second order uh, equation for the A coefficient, which is uh, just the Louisville equation. And then for the B function, they just give a uh, kind of Poisson equation relating it to the A coefficient. Um, so by solving the Liouville equation and matching uh, one coefficient with perturbation theory to fix the boundary condition, uh, we find that E to the A in the uh, frame of the infrared effective coupling. So sigma is the abelian infrared effective coupling. That's our convention. E to the A is 16 over M sigma squared. And then E to the B has a sort of more complicated functional form. Um, and work, working it out was a bit more work and, and, and so on, and used uh, many interesting modern things involving the double scaling limit. But uh, the, the output is that the exponent, exponentiated B coefficient in the scheme as Peston and Nekrasov compute um, is a uh, uh, gamma sub, uh, the, the glacier constant to the 12th power, e to the minus one, two to the minus nine halves, pi to the minus three halves, and then some 
absolute values of some modular functions. This is the modular lambda function, the modular eta function, uh, and so on. Okay, so these a and b coefficients can be worked out in any scheme, which frees us from having to take double differences. And it improves the numerical accuracy of the match uh, to a point <coughs> where the error in the EFT approximation um, compared to the exact result has to be exaggerated in order to be visible at all. Um, so it's, these errors are even at quite low R charge are practically invisible, even when you blow them up. So by going to weak coupling, so in this plot, the horizontal axis is weaker and weaker coupling. So going to weak coupling, you can kind of see uh, the beginnings of a deviation. Oops, um, sorry. And then this is here, the lines are um, increasing uh, R charge and the, uh, the each individual line is a different value of the coupling. Anyway, so you can see these, these errors are very hard to see just in the EFT approximation. So now, finally, uh, let me see how much time, okay, in the remaining two minutes, uh, I will just say that you can use the exact same strategy, uh, supersymmetric recursion relations together with EFT inputs uh, to solve an asymptotic expansion for the exponentially small corrections uh, as well. Um, so one can get a handle on those by the same, by the same strategy. Uh, this ZMMP here is the macroscopic massive propagation factor of the, of the uh, partition function with sources. It's the piece that comes purely from uh, massive particles, things beyond the EFT. And it also obeys a recursion relation. Basically by subtracting out the EFT piece and seeing what relation the remainder satisfies. Um, the recursion relation is one input. Um, the, the structure of the asymptotic expansion is dictated by EFT is another input. And then perturbation theory uh, gives, uh, gives uh, uh, one additional integration coefficient to solve the recursion relations with order by order. So skipping a, a lot of detail, uh, let's see, how do, how, how do I, explain this. Um, the negative of the log of the log of the MMP function is something we'll call curly W, gothic W. And it has this asymptotic expansion where the leading term is this world line instanton action, this e to the minus uh, BPS mass times the radius. Uh, then uh, the log of a determinantal prefactor, and then a series of power law corrections to the log of the massive, uh, of the exponentially small correction itself. So this is an extremely uh, high order of precision. Um, and we can, uh, we can calculate these guys to uh, arbitrary order. I've lift, lifted up to, uh, uh, next to next to next to next to next to next to leading order here, but now we've computed up to um, 18 uh, or I think 19 next twos um, in work in progress. So you can see uh, S is the imaginary part of uh, sigma. Sigma is the complexified infrared inverse coupling. So you can see these these terms have a rather simple form. Um, so now, basically because the errors are too small to see visually on a plot, I'm now plotting not the values themselves, not even the values of the MMP function itself, but the number of digits of accuracy to which the localization value of the exponentially small correction agrees with the EFT computation. Uh, of the exponentially small correction from the world line, uh, uh, the world line behavior. So, uh, you know, down at uh, R charge 20, you have already like uh, three digits of accuracy. Uh, 
and then you know it goes up very quickly. And the thing you can see here is that for each successive order uh, you add to the asymptotic expansion, the the accuracy improves by like one half an order to one order of magnitude every time. So um, it's certainly not a coincidental uh, agreement. And then this is in a, in a different limit, a double scaling limit. I didn't have time to uh, discuss too much, but again, uh, increasing accuracy with every order of the asymptotic expansion. And this is just an asymptotic expansion of the exponentially small correction to the EFT, uh, uh, the dominant EFT term. What's going on at the spikes? The spikes are accidental accuracies. So, um, right, so, since I'm taking the number of, of digits of accuracy, this is really the uh, negative one over log 10 times the log of the difference between uh, the localization result and the, the estimate over the exact result. Um, but uh, sometimes, you know, the exact the estimate crosses the exact result. So you're taking a log of zero. So these, there are these little spikes, which are accidental accuracies. Okay, so you say there's no physical significance to the spike. That's I don't a... think so, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. It just, you know, the, the double scaled estimates oscillate around the exact answer a bit. It looks like the, uh, the fixed coupling estimates don't. Um, anyway, here's a table of successive refined estimates. So you can see, and this table I only went up to, and in the paper, I only went up to next to next to next to next to next to next to leading order. But you can see already for, you know, n equals 10, you already match to, you know, to a percent. And then um, up at, oops. And then uh, up at, uh, you know, n equals 120 or n equals 110, you match to one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, seven digits. And again, this is a match of the exponentially small correction to the EFT result as compared with, uh, with the theoretical prediction. So, okay. Um, so I, I don't have time to talk about the Argyris Douglas stuff, which was the only new content and we still haven't solved it. Anyway, uh, the large J expansion gives an analytically controlled way to compute CFT data outside of uh, any other sort of simplifying limit, particularly illuminating simple behavior in regimes where numerical bootstrap methods cannot currently access, uh, despite formal similarity of the expansions. Uh, the large J predictions in cases such as the O2 model and various uh, extended superconformal theories uh, with one dimensional Coulomb branch agree extremely well, even at low J, with uh, other methods, Monte Carlo, bootstrap, uh, localization. And these results have greatly improved our quantitative control and even conceptual understanding, I think, of even the simplest strongly coupled CFT. And uh, I believe analysis of more examples is sure to yield further interesting surprises about the large scale structure of theory space. So thank you all in there. Okay, let's thank uh, Simeon. And if you have a question, just go ahead and um, unmute and ask. Hi Simeon, very nice talk. I just want to remark that when I was a young algebraic geometry student, MMP always meant minimal model program. Wait, sorry, David, you just broke up a little bit. Could you say yeah. it again? What, when I was a what young mean, algebraic, algebraic geometry, geometry, when I was a young algebraic geometry student, MMP meant minimal model program. It just struck Maybe. me as I was watching your talk. Completely That's irrelevant to, to, to what you're doing. And there was no numerics. Has it been solved? Pardon? Has the minimal model program been solved? In a way, yeah. Okay, so then I can have the abbreviation. <laughs> okay. Another question? Go ahead. Uh, <clears throat> so implicitly, you're saying something about the, the density of states at large R charge or not? So could, could you say that again? So um, can you say anything about the density of states uh, in the CFT at large R charge using this or? Yeah, I mean, I think to say that you don't even need all of this uh, 
detail. I mean, if, by density of states, you mean density of states of like order one excited above the ground state. Correct, yeah. So I say, or let's look, list the spectrum of all the CFT operators and let's say how many such states are there near the, the, the fixed sector you have control over. Um, right, so, right. so, from, so the, the effective theory is, uh, is the same as the theory of a free chiral superfield. So the density yeah. of states, even for non-BPS states, is just the same as uh, in, a, in a free vector multiplet. Yeah. And then of course, you know, for non-BPS states, there are tiny corrections that are suppressed at large J, but, but for this, for rank one, the density of states is, uh, is just the same as, as in a free theory. Um, for, for higher rank, you know, it's, it's a different effective theory. So, uh, you know, th then there are more, well, for higher rank, you know, even what effective theory you have probably depends on which operator you're, you're picking and then it's more complicated. But um, mm -hmm. yeah, rank one, it's, it's just the uh, same as a free vector model. Sure, yeah, I had more in mind the case where it might have like a holographic dual. And in particular, if you wanted to know something about like R charged black holes, then can I use anything like this to get access to that or not? Um, yeah, so, so surely, well, it depends. I mean, like this is a sliding scale, yeah. but it, in the sense that uh, it seems likely that there's some, some effective theory. Yeah, I mean, I think the answer is, is probably yes. In fact, there was a relatively recent paper. Um, it's in the reference list. I, I, I don't want to um, omit any authors, so let me make sure I, um, 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 um. I, I believe it was, uh, Criminese, Lanza, and Martucci um, very recently looked at, uh, you know, large R charge in the holographic regime. Um, I forget exactly how they were scaling things, but, you know, they have some sort of EFT, which describes, you know, a lot of the charge string theory stuff. I see. But I, I mean, I haven't had a chance to really go through this paper, but I think it's, you know, extremely interesting um, and should be, that question should be pursued. There, there have also been papers on um, large charge in sort of, you know, generic, like non-supersymmetric gravity theories, these things that we don't know too much about from the holographic point of view, but you know, yes, <laughs> people love to talk about. <laughs> yeah, I know. Uh, this is being recorded, so you know, whatever. But uh, you know, it's it's a subject, and people. Can't, it's a thing. <laughs> people can't analyze it, um, yeah. and and there there was a paper by um, Orlando Sarkar, and Lucas, and maybe somebody else, and I'm sorry, whoever it was, if I'm forgetting you, but I think maybe just those three, um, on um large charge in like Einstein Maxwell theory and holographic theories. And they do find some, some very interesting things like, you know, if you have a hugely super horizon, uh, ADS right through north from black hole that you can identify a sort of, you know, hydrodynamic mode at the boundary mm. in ADS. Um, I'm just, uh, no, nothing wrong with that paper as far as I can tell. I'm, my personal view is that, that uh, the extreme Reisner Nordstrom ADS black hole is not ever the true ground state. Mm -hmm. I think it's always quantum mechanically unstable to swing or emission. I think many people believe this, but there doesn't seem to be a complete consensus on it. I think because nobody ever actually wrote down the Schwinger instant on it. Um, this is a good problem for a graduate student anybody who has a graduate student who can do relativity um, because it would be good to settle that question. But I, I think probably the black hole is not even the, the charged ground state. Okay. Um, so, so it's not, but yeah, for BPS black holes and string theory, it's a whole different story. And, you know, BMN is, is one limit, which is not quite the same limit as, as any of the others I mentioned. Um, you know, the, there are many limits you can take in n equals four at large charge, scaling various things. 
Okay, thanks. Okay, we can stop the recording for now, and then there could be free discussion as needed.